if our media partners don't have any preliminary stuff, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, we're, okay, thank you. We'll go right into it then. So today we uh, um, passed the um, Build Back Better Act, and we have um, details on the provisions that are contained in that act. We also um, last week addressed the um, infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And I know that some of you are reaching out to us, asking us to comment on those details. We appreciate your patience on us withholding comment at that time, because we were always talking about the two bills as somewhat of a package. And um, what kind of ha happened over, over the uh, months of negotiations on the two bills was some things got put into one bill, some things got put into another bill. And so the, the, the final um, outcome uh, depended on where things ended up in what particular bill. There, this actually caused some confusion nationally uh, because when the um, infrastructure bill passed, uh, there was an assumption that the Build Back Better Act passed. And so um, though for those um, uh, constituencies in those districts that did not kind of contain the information into a single message, um, it did cause confusion as to whether or not Build Back Better actually passed in all of its provisions um, versus the limited provisions that were in the infrastructure bill. So our office made the decision to um, not press out the passage of the infrastructure bill because we didn't want to confuse our media partners and we didn't want to confuse our people on what exactly was moving forward. And so tonight we're comfortable um, bifurcating the two and speaking very clearly on which um, items were actually passed into law already and which are on a very strong trajectory to pass into law. So with respect to the infrastructure bill, the one that was all, um, passed last week, that bill already passed the House a while ago. It passed the Senate. It came back to the House for a final um, approval, and then it went to the president's desk for signature. The infrastructure bill is signed into law. And so these provisions are already provisions that we can look forward to. Um, there's no other legislative or executive action that needs to happen with respect to it becoming uh, a mandate and a funding source that's going to be available for the island and the people of Guam. So first we have in the infrastructure bill, um, $95 million for repairs of roads and bridges. We have $11.4 million directly investing into public transportation. This is particularly going to be going to increasing our bus fleet. We have $25 million to ex expand broadband into our community, $30 million for secure clean water for families, and $30 million to further invest into our airport. A little bit of detail on the um, specifics of those numbers for the roads and bridges. Um, for the $95 million that we're anticipating we also have an eligibility to compete for a pool of $7.5 billion for road projects that focus on climate change and user safety. So the $95 million is over the next five years, plus $7.5 billion in competitive grant funding. Um, there's $11.4 million for public transportation uh, for those bus purchases on top of a nationwide competitive grants process of an additional $2.6 billion. So we can get eleven point four, but we're also going to be able to put in for another $2.6 billion. On the 25 million for broadband coverage, families with up to 200% of the federal poverty level will be eligible for a new $30 a month broadband subsidy and a $100 device subsidy to help connect with the internet. So basically, we're gonna be able to help pay for your um, uh, internet bills, which is gonna be very, very good for our families. It begins as a formula grant program and phases into a competitive grant program that'll be handled at the local government level. And it provides funding for unserved, uh, underserved service project areas, those of internet speeds that are below 25 megabits per second, and underserved service projects below 100 to 120 megabits per second, connecting eligible community anchor institutions. So a lot of our people will be able to qualify for these um, broadband uh, subsidies. Guam is going to be getting 2.5 million to protect against cyber attacks. This is also going to be a formula grant. We're very going to, we're going to be very grateful for that. Um, and access to 
clean public water systems, funding to uh, address contaminants within the water supply, funding to replace uh, any lead service lines and water delivery infrastructure, funding to conduct studies on watershed needs. This is very important for our southern flooding areas. And it authorizes a competitive grant program to address stormwater infrastructure technology, which prioritizes local governments. This $30 million for water infrastructure, I just wanted to clarify because there was some concern that the um, water infrastructure percentages that we got in this infrastructure bill were lower than the percentages that we got in previous funding rounds for other legislative actions. I just want to clarify that even though the percentages were a little lower in this bill, it doesn't change our formulas in any other future funding rounds. The, um, the, the reality is that this is additional funding on top of what we've already been receiving. And so the formulas are a little different in order to fit with what they were trying to navigate in terms of budget constraint. But this is funding above and beyond the regular formula funding that Guam does receive for water infrastructure. So our water infrastructure funding should not be adversely affected on a regular and ongoing basis. Uh, we also have... Um, the Build Back Better Act, which passed just today. And this one is the, uh, the much bigger package. And this one still needs to make its way through the Senate and it needs to make its way to the uh, president's desk. Now, on that note, there are two important points to, to bear in mind. And these are the reasons why we are optimistic about, about what we have to present at this time. Uh, first and foremost, the Congressional Budget Office and the um, Senate parliamentarian had to scrub the bill to make sure that as it is transmitted to the Senate, it meets certain rules and standards. And both CBO and parliamentarian, to my understanding, have basically said that all the provisions in the bill that we just passed, because they've looked at it in advance, are provisions that on a, on a technical basis and on a procedural basis, meet muster for the Senate to be able to entertain it. So on that basis, it's very good news that we're not going to have to worry about some kind of technicality or procedural um, objection um, resulting in any of our particular provisions getting canceled out. And so now it just boils down to whether or not there's the political will within the majority to be able to pass the language as, as, um, as stated. And that brings us to the second point uh, of, of why we have confidence in this. The passage of the first bill, the infrastructure bill, was part of the whole negotiations between the House and the Senate. Certain senators wanted the infrastructure bill to pass first as a sign of good faith, and then they'll entertain the, um, the um, Build Back Better Act, the larger package. Uh, there were some members that were going back and forth saying, you know, we want it all to happen at once. And, and that was where there was some initial gridlock um, a few months ago, but that gridlock has since um, eased. Um, the House did do its part and pass the infrastructure side. We are now looking forward to um, that act of good faith being reciprocated on the Senate side with um, passage of the Build Back Better Act. So we're looking forward to that. We'll see where that goes. My anticipation is the Senate should take this up and entertain it um, definitely before the end of the year and hopefully before um, in the first half of December. Um, because they do, it does have provisions that impact um, the tax code, particularly the child tax credit. And, the, and, and if those are going to be carried forward, they're going to want to pass that into law before 2022 rolls around. So let me go into Build Back Better. The Build Back Better Act is going to provide us with uh, a billion for critical infrastructure. Um, this is the money that uh, actually is going to result in about 345 million likely coming to Guam. Uh, we can use that to build a new hospital. That language is still in the bill, the 345 million for a new hospital for new critical infrastructure. We have about $25 million that's going to be going into um, new affordable housing programs, whether it's gonna be in the form of down payment assistance or building out new units. We have 31 million in community development block grants that are gonna be coming to Guam. That's a 10 times increase on a year over year basis. We usually get 3.1 million. Those CDBG grants are gonna be able to um, be used to fund anything from maybe even a, a, a new police headquarters, if that's where we really wanna pour the money into, or to um, you know, hardening up infrastructure, fixing all of our parks, our basketball courts, getting our gyms renovated, getting new gyms built, fixing those swimming pools that are all broken all over the island. Um, you know, the, These funds can go to all of those um, different recreation needs or all of those different community development needs. So um, $31 million is, is a, serious, a, a serious sum and we're very happy to be able to expand it in that way. There's also going to be an additional 320 million in territorial highway program funding. 
Um, that's going to be divided among the territories, but of course, us being um, the larger of the uh, insular territories should see a substantial chunk of that coming in as well. So that's highway money coming in on the Build Back Better on top of highway money coming in on the infrastructure bill. Altogether, we're looking at about a $45 million annual highway funding um, cycle for the next five years. That's up from $17 million. Uh, and then we're looking at chunks of, of highway funding that's going to be able to come out for particular highway projects that we want to put through. Additionally, in the Build Back Better, we're going to have lower child care and family care costs. We're going to expand the basic promise of free schooling in America for the first time in 100 years with universal preschool for all three and four year old um, children that are going to be now going, not now, who are going to be able to go to the preschools that we set up. This is going to be um, funded for about six years. So we can look forward to a solid six year universal pre-K program opening up in our public school system. We're also going to have access to about a billion dollars in section 811 and 202 funding. Those two programs are funding for disability housing and senior citizen housing. That provision was also retained in the Build Back Better Act. And so uh, we can look forward to applying for those grants and, and hopefully getting awarded. Uh, we have a serious need to be able to build out housing capacity in both those areas, um, especially as our baby boomer generation continues to age. And uh, as the big question looming over families of people with disabilities, you know, just continues to linger of, you know, what's going to happen to my loved one, you know, when I'm gone. Um, having the housing component uh, taken care of is going to be a very, a very big step in putting that, that uh, worry to ease. We're also, of course, having the $140 million for Medicaid as the um, pool for the matching funds. Uh, and we're increasing the federal match from 80, uh, to 83% and 17%. And so that's in this Build Back Better Act as well, the, the fix for Medicaid. And that basically puts us into a, um, into a Medicaid schedule that's going to have us pretty much aligned with the rest of the country. They may have a, an edge of like maybe one or 2%, but you know, this, is, this is phenomenal. We're also going to have um, what, is, what does amount to the largest investment to combat climate crisis in the nation's history. Um, for Guam, we're going to be getting $30 million in technical assistance for climate change, mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. So we're going to be able to use these technical grants to be able to identify what our, um, what our critical uh, infrastructure needs are going to be on the climate change issue. Uh, drilling down to a little bit more detail, if you just give me a minute here. I did have one, uh, a few more items of clarification. Let me pull them up here. Apologize. We have a one year extension of the child tax credit increases of $300 per month for children under six or $250 per month for children aged six to 17, and it is refundable. And so again, you're going to be able to receive this as a cash payment uh, in advance rather than having to wait to take it as a credit. If you haven't received your child tax credit payments um, yet from GovGuang, or if you only received a certain amount, um, please take note of that as you file your taxes um, for 2021 in the next, in the coming calendar year because you should, be, you should be writing off the, the remainder of that credit that you did not receive when you filed your taxes. Going into 2022, um, that tax credit should continue to be, again, refunded to you, so you should be getting that as an advanced payment. We have um, some, some really cool things here also in terms of uh, uh, affordable, high-quality childcare by limiting childcare costs for families to, more than, to no more than 7% of income for families earning up to 250% of the state median income. Again, I believe that's about 40, uh, 45,000 if I'm not mistaken. So if you make 250% above that, if you make less than 250% above that, then you're going to be able to qualify for subsidies that will ensure that your childcare costs are no more than 7% of your income. So if it's more than that, you're going to be getting a subsidy to offset that. There is in-state tuition for Guam College students with bachelor degree students eligible for up to $15,000 per year to make up the difference between in-state and out-of-state tuition at public colleges nationwide. 
So if you graduate from high school in Guam and you want to attend um, University of uh, you know, Southern California, University of Arizona, Harvard, Yale, um, whatever the um, differences between the out-of-state tuition um, and your tuition that you're paying, you'll be able to get a $15,000 uh, credit to offset the difference in that tuition to help you go to school uh, in other places if that's what you so choose to do. I want to credit to Congressman Sablon. This was a, something that he was working very hard to push through on the Education Committee, and it, it, it made its way through. Um, and we also have an increase in the Pell Grant for low-income students. It's going to go up by about $550 per year. And so our university, our Guam Community College, is going to be able to afford even more assistance. Um, hopefully, our students can even be able to take more credits and, and help to accelerate their um, degree programs. And last but not least, we have retained the extension of the Supplemental Security Income Program to um, our senior citizens and disabled citizens in Guam. Uh, SSI is still in the Build Back Better Act that has passed the House. So with that, I believe that we've covered all the provisions that have gotten through. Uh, we'll go ahead and open up to any questions from any of our media partners at this time. I have a question. Thank you very much, Congressman. All right, we have begun the question order. We'll go ahead and recognize Troy from Candid and Jerry from PNC shortly. Troy, you're Hi. recognized. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much. Is this is that Tinelta? Hi, Hi Congressman. Um, uh, first, I didn't catch, and I'm so sorry. What is that? A uh, what is that FPL eligibility for the broadband assistance? Let me pull it back up real quick. I thought I heard 200%. 200% of the federal federal poverty level. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and then on the $31 million uh, for CDBG, is that 31 million every year now or just this year? No, that's just for oh. that's just for this uh, this program year. Yeah. Oh, okay. we, we can we can try and work on that, but we'll okay. see. <laughs> yeah. There'll be a lot of bond borrowing if you if you got that in. Um <laughs> uh, on the uh, on a universal pre-K for three-year-old and four-year-old kids. Um, uh, wow. Okay. So has I, I, this is a two-part question? Then has um, has this been discussed with GDOE as something that they uh, are even remotely ready to implement? How long will it? Or when when will this funding start to come? And is there anything? Uh, that they, is there any part of the funding that they can use for training and recruitment of uh, uh, pre-K teachers? Those are very good questions, um, particularly the training and recruitment questions. I, give me an opportunity to, to sit down and brief uh, GDOE and get them up to speed so that I'm not um, speaking out of turn for them. Um, and, and when we do that, uh, I would also advise perhaps that we do it in a similar format where um, we, of course, will have media partners available to posit questions to GDOE as far as their readiness um, to implement the program. Okay, and, and lastly, just because I know this is probably gonna be the most exciting part for a lot of people is uh, the one-year extension of the ACTC. Mm -hmm. So it's the, it's the same amount in the same uh, eligibility categories as the ACTC right now. It just moves beyond December of this year into December of next year, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. Now recognizing Jerry with the PNC. Jerry, you are recognized. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, uh, Congressman, can you give us a, a, a final uh, total figure on how many millions of dollars overall Guam can expect to get from this Build, uh, Build Back Better Act? Oh my goodness. You know, you guys, <laughs> when we give you a big figure, you say, can you give me a breakdown? We give you a breakdown, you want a big figure. Let me, uh, my team is on the line. Um, guys, can you, can, you, can you crunch all that into one solid number so I can get an answer for Jerry? I just have it as a breakdown right now, Jerry, but uh, I don't want to give you a, a misquote on, on the full and final figure. Uh, you know, just, uh, just an estimate if it's possible. Uh, and offhand, is, are we getting more uh, money from the Build Back Better than from the infrastructure bill that was passed? That I can say absolutely yes. Um, the infrastructure bill is a healthy nearly $200 million sum. Um, this one is going to push closer to, um, uh, I'm looking at uh, closer to about, about $1.5 if not $1.75 uh, depending on how 
um, we calculate the um, the full value of things like SSI that's going to have a permanent um, a permanent budgetary uh, benefit for Guam. Uh, but definitely, we're over a billion dollars uh, in this one, going into one point five to one point seven five for the Build Back Better. Okay, and just a few more questions. Uh, uh, what's your reaction to the to the governor's statement uh, last Friday that she says uh, she's scaling back the the allotment for the planned new hospital from 300 million to 220 million because of this millions of dollars that uh, she's getting from the from the Build Better Act? Do you think uh, that's enough of a of a uh, of a downscale, or do you want her to, uh, you know, a lot more to the to other projects? Well, I'm glad the governor is is moving in what I would say is is, a, is the right direction of how to use relief funding. That's the purpose of why those relief funds were provided. Uh, I think that the passage of the bill kind of gives her cover to walk back where she's been standing on this issue. Uh, the passage of the bill is just in the House; it's not enacted into law. You know, and I, I, I think she knows that. And I think that um, she's really just using this as a, as a good uh, um, cover opportunity to be able to kind of change direction without looking like she's, you know, doing it under any kind of advisement from, from our office or from anybody else in the legislature, which is okay. But uh, I, I really think that um, this um, 345 million for the hospital, we can look forward to. We did communicate with Treasury because the governor has been telling the media and telling the public that she's waiting for guidance from Treasury on whether she can use that 300 million for a hospital. And we asked Treasury, we said, hey, where's this guidance my governor keeps asking for? And Treasury came back and said, we're not issuing any further guidance. We told everybody, base your decisions on the interim final rule. And if you can't do it based on the interim final rule, then don't do it. There is a final rule that will be coming out. And if you wanna wait until the final rule comes out um, to make any kind of spending decisions, that's your prerogative but we're not going to be giving any kind of further guidance on how funds are to be spent outside of the interim final rule. So long story short, um, there is no guidance that we're waiting for from Treasury on whether this money can be used for a hospital. They made their position very, very clear that what's in the interim final rule is what's allowed. And so if the governor still is unsure about using that funds, then she's probably waiting and hoping for a change or some kind of outcome in the final final rule um, but that's, you know, the, the, when that happens is, is difficult to foresee. Uh, but in the meantime, when we have things like this moving forward, and when we have opportunities to program those funds into where it's supposed to go for relief, that's something that we think is a good thing. We want to see more of that. You know, I was hoping that we could see some kind of, you know, Thanksgiving stimulus for our essential workers. You know, that this is the best time to, you know, put our money where our mouth is for Thanksgiving and give thanks to our essential workers with the Thanksgiving stimulus. You know, going into Christmas, I would very much encourage further tapping that funding source for a Christmas stimulus for our people. Um, things are kind of starting to tap out in the community. We wanna keep injecting resources and doing so by giving out these stimulus fundings with the money that's been made available for that purpose will help to keep the economy moving forward and will just help to keep the, the fabric and the morale of the community together. So those monies are available. We would encourage them to be used for that purpose uh, I'm glad that it looks like the governor may be changing her tune, and we hope that she continues to do so um, with the remainder of the funds. So, Congressman, that that 345 million from Build Better, uh, Build Back Better, is for Guam, right? It's going to be allotted for Guam, but not necessarily for a new hospital. Is that what U.S. Treasury is saying? Um, that's not what U.S. Treasury is saying. The, so, so when we when we crafted this language, it was part of a process called budget reconciliation. Budget reconciliation is a very delicate budget uh, budget process because you cannot create new programs. You can only budget for existing programs or existing functions. And so, when we um, were working to set aside funding for what is a new hospital. We could not specify in the language that it's for that purpose because then we are creating a new project. What we could do and what we did do in the bill is we simply allotted a sum to, to the Department of Interior for critical infrastructure. That is aligned with the mission of Department of Interior and that is aligned with the rules that govern the um, uh, crafting of legislation in the budget reconciliation process. Now, the purpose of those funds ultimately will be discretionary to Department of Interior. Um, we are going to, um, of course, make, make the case that those funds should be used 
uh, for the purpose of funding what we would like to see as a new hospital. But again, in order to comply with the um, uh, parameters and the requirements of the budget reconciliation process, the funding was provided um, as a lump sum, and it was provided on a general basis for critical infrastructure with the actual projects to be determined by the agency themselves. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a time-consuming, complicated conversation, but it's, it's the way things are, are put together out here. Thanks for understanding, Jerry. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Congressman, we now have Nestor with the question. Nestor, you are recognized. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alfredo, Congressman. Just to follow up on uh, Jerry's question regarding the, the hospital, just so uh, we're clear, I think um, you had encouraged the governor previously that with the $345 million that's going to go to um, from uh, DOI uh, for possible construction of the hospital, that she should take um, that $300 million she was holding in reserve for the hospital and go ahead and spend that, correct? Yes, we're very much encouraging it. Those funds were for relief. And so we're very much encouraging that it be used for relief. We understand the needs of getting a project like a hospital off the ground. We did the back work necessary to be able to find a different federal funding source to make that happen. Now that funding source is in play, let's get that funding out to the, to the people that provide the relief for them. You, you mentioned that the CBO has uh, scrubbed it and it meets technical muster, but that uh, it ultimately it's going to be up to um, you know the political will. Um, what's your sense? Uh, are, all of the Guam related provisions do you think um, pretty safe or is is there anything on that list that you outline that might be you know 50 50 or precarious as of right now I'm, I'm fairly confident given the scrub from CBO and from Senate parliamentarian that these are all going to be okay um, I would like to um, thank my counterpart on the on the Republican Party chairman um, Juan Carlos Benitez he did um, organize a party letter um, to all Republicans, um, asking them on the, in, the, um, in the Congress to also support our Guam provisions. So we're really circling the wagons around Guam right now. And um, I don't see anything that may put these items at risk unless there's going to be some kind of surprise or some kind of grandstanding that we're not, um, we're not uh, anticipating at this time. But so far, so far, so good, I would say, Nestor. And assuming the uh, Senate, it clears the Senate and it goes back to the House and you guys pass it, um, how soon will uh, the funding be available, do you think? Um, for a lot of these items, they'll be available immediately. For some of them, it has a more protracted timeline. Um, we, can, we can give you those details at a later time. Like, for example, um, SSI, because everything needed to fit within a certain um, budget limit, um, SSI's window does not turn on until 2024. And so that's going to give us time to really stand up the program, identify all everyone who's eligible, build up the database that once it does turn on, everything just gets seamless and the funding starts going out. But the um, extension of that timeline to 2024, for example, was, an, uh, was um, one, uh, one step that was taken to help make sure that everything compressed into a tighter, um, a tighter budgetary uh, allotment. So some of these things will be available immediately. Some of them will be available um, at a later date. We can um, work on getting the, the particular breakdowns for you guys um, uh, after we get off the conference, and I'll be able to send that to you when we have it together. Okay, this, this one's a little bit into the weeds, but uh, we saw that um, there would be, in the reduction of prescription drug costs that you mentioned, a cap, a $35 cap on monthly supply of insulin, with, and this just happens to be Diabetes Awareness Month here in Guam that we're, we're celebrating. So this could be a, a pretty significant thing for so many people on Guam. Are you aware of... Um, whether that remains intact? It should, it should have. I haven't heard otherwise, but I don't want to speak out of turn. Let me have my team circle back on that, on that particular item. What we did was we just put together for this particular press conference, the Guam specific provisions, but there are some um, other national provisions that should be extending similar to what you're talking about. But let me drill down on that, um, Nestor, and we'll get back to you on it. Okay, um, and uh, on a different topic, um, I want to ask you the same question that was asked of you last month at the chamber meeting. Are, are you running for governor and is there anyone that you're considering as a running mate? Well, um, as I, I was asked the question a, a little bit uh, not too long ago. Um, and what we said at the time and what we're saying still today is that we, we are preparing for it. We are looking at um, these long term outstanding issues on our island that haven't been resolved. Um, we want to, if we're going to do this, we're going to go in there and we're going to fix these items. You know, we have things like the Tomorrow Land Trust. We have the needs to, I mean, Simon Sanchez, 
I remember when we built the new legislature and I was sitting there saying, we, we're celebrating this and Simon Sanchez still isn't fixed, you know? So, you know, we, we have a lot of legacy issues in healthcare, education, public safety, GPD doesn't have a home. Um, our public transportation is still nowhere where it needs to be in order for us to be able to use it reliably and, and to have confidence that it's gonna be something that's gonna be a, you know, working asset in our community. Swimming pools, like I mentioned earlier in the call, broken all over the island. Um, and, you know, something as simple as road markings are still things that we're just not getting done. So, you know, as we, as we um, continue to uh, work towards that, um, that outcome, we're definitely doing the work, the, the, the preliminary work necessary to understand what the job is going to entail, where we need to focus our energy, how we're going to go in there and, and resolve these issues. Um, we even talked about things like affordable housing, bringing down taxes, reducing the cost of living, helping to positively impact gas prices. There's so many um, local initiatives that we can that we can start working on, and we're definitely doing the homework necessary to fully understand them and to present uh, solutions to tackle them, uh, even though they're kind of out of uh, out of left field. So, um, as far as any kind of formal announcement, we will not be taking that step until we're absolutely certain that um, we have a firm handle on the fact that making that decision is going to be for the greater benefit of the people of Guam, if they will, um, of course, um, have us have us fill in for that role, if they'll elect us for that role, it's ultimately going to be their decision. But um, yeah, we're still we're still evaluating things. And we're still absolutely sizing up the, 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 the nature of the responsibility, but it's, it's very much on the table, Nestor. All right. And in, in this evaluation, are you considering potential running mates? Um, there's a lot of great people out there. Uh, I think uh, uh, another uh, a news channel did a poll and, and so many names came up. There's, there's a lot of really, really good people out there with tremendous expertise that have a lot of positive things to contribute to the island. Um, and, you know, many in many in ways that uh, are, you know, very complementary to what, what we're lacking on our end or, or very complementary on further bolstering what we're strong in. Uh, so I don't think that there's going to be any real shortage of, of um, seeking out a... Uh, a running mate. Uh, so we're gonna we're, we're first going to actually line up what the work is going to entail, because whoever we have that discussion with, we're gonna sit down and say, hey, by the way, this is what you're really getting yourself into. You know, this isn't going to be a ribbon cutting, proclamation signing, um, uh, frou frou type of of service. We're gonna get in there and we're gonna do some real grind work to get this done. Are you up for it? And ultimately, that's going to decide who the running mate's going to be. It's gonna have to be somebody, of course, who's aligned with. Um, the um, the philosophies, but more so dedicated to the work. Um, the people of Guam ultimately are wanting outcomes, and it's going to have to be somebody who's ready to, you know, kind of go down the same road I did and 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 add add more of these on, <laughs> um, you know, in order to get things done for our people. So we have not, of course, selected anybody or or have any kind of final final person in mind, but uh, it's it's going to be someone who's going to have the same kind of commitments and fully understand what the job's going to entail. Are you considering someone outside of the Democrat, Democratic Party? I, I, would, I would be open. I would be open to someone outside the Democratic Party, uh, anybody you know, running from any other party, any independents. Uh, uh, again, it's, it's never been about party. It's about trying to find the right, um, the right uh, you know, chemistry and the right partnership to be able to get things done. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of people out there who, who would uh, associate as Democrats, as Republicans, and as independents who, who would fill that, fill that uh that uh, qualification. So uh, we, we would we would absolutely look look um, you know high and low and and see who's who's interested. Um, but party is not going to be the determining factor. It's going to be uh, commitment. It's going to be capability, uh, and it's going to be the uh, you know an understanding that this is going to be one hell of a one hell of a grind. But the outcome and the um, and the end result is going to be worth it. We want to find that that special person. And, and finally, uh, when do you uh, anticipate you're going to be making a decision? It's hard to say. Um, again, we're going, like I said, we're evaluating these, we're evaluating these issues. We want to make sure we have a firm handle on it. Uh, when, when we, when we get there, um, uh, and then when we have that conversation with whoever um, ultimately is going to potentially be a, you know, our, our lieutenant, um, that's when, of course, uh, any kind of uh, announcements will be made. But we're, we're still very much in the, uh, in the uh, fact finding um, phase of things. We want to make sure that we're doing this and we have the right information in front of us. Um, it's not about it's not about running and it's not about winning an election. It's about, you know, understanding the work and getting there and doing it the right way. So that's that's what we're focusing on right now. As far as timelines, it's it's still too soon to tell. All right. Uh, thanks, Congressman. Thank you, Nestor.
Thank you, Nexon. Now recognizing Phil Leon Guerrero for your question. Thank you, Congressman. If you could just indulge one uh, last election question since Nestor uh, kind of got the ball rolling. Um, how much uh, is who is going to run for your potentially vacant seat uh, weighing your decision whether or not you're going to run for governor since you uh, seeking that office would leave our lone seat in the House of Representatives vacant? That, that's, a, that's a great question, Phil. And that, that, that actually is um, absolutely a part of what we're having to weigh um, because it's not just a matter of whether or not we're going to um, vacate this seat and potentially seek another. And again, there's no guarantees that that will even be successful. The people will be the ones to decide if that is successful. Um, and, and really, it would be presumptu presumptuous of us to think that we're going to even still be in this seat. The people of, of Guam are going to decide who their next congressman is, whether it's going to be me or somebody else. Um, but absolutely, um, those who may be interested in running for Congress would certainly um, uh, weigh in on, on the decision that we make. Uh, we, we, want, we want to make sure that um, it, we have candidates of, of quality. Um, running for all of our offices, but more specifically, if it's one that we're going to be vacating, then it's somebody that's going to be able to continue um, the forward progress that we've we've gotten going for the uh, for the office and for the people of Guam. Uh, so absolutely, you know, who 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 seeks or who would like to seek the congressional office would would definitely definitely be a factor in um, in ultimately what we decide to do because we don't want to go backwards, you know, and, and we want to keep Guam um, in a place in the Congress where we are currently. We want to, we want to keep her um, in that positive place, you know, in that place where there's a, there's a, a member to member point of view that, that is based on a, a lot of mutual respect and uh, a lot of um, uh, collegiality and able to, uh, an ability to work together for each other's goals. So those are, those are just the kind of things that we, we definitely will be thinking about so, so yes, that's, that's absolutely something to keep in mind. So back to the legislation, I, I do have a couple of uh, questions just to clarify on the universal pre-K program that you mentioned, you referenced mm -hmm. that uh, this would be uh, handled by the public school system, but we do have a number of private daycares and preschools. I'm wondering if they're included, if they would be beneficiaries under this universal program. Uh, again, I, I need to sit down with DOE and we need to have a, a, a conversation about what's coming out and, and then kind of what their vision is. I don't want to, I don't want to kind of go out there and, and tell DOE what to do in terms of how to set this up. Um, it has to be within their capacity and it has to be something that they feel like they're going to be able to succeed with. Uh, but on that note, of course, the conversation will entail how do we try to incorporate um, private operators? Are there ways that we can um, um, extract some kind of a win-win situation here where they kind of have some kind of charter school um, function or something like that. We, we can definitely look into those things. Um, but as far as the, um, the child care providers, um, even with the universal pre-K um, potentially having um, what, what I'm, I'm kind of reading between the lines in your question here, but potentially having some kind of a customer impact or market impact on their client base. Um, the fact also that we're going to be having um, the uh, child care cap at 7% of 250% of median income. Uh, I think we're actually going to see more um, families um, opting in for child care. And, you know, one of the reasons why that, that um, child care component was put in here was because we want to mobilize the workforce. We want people to be able to say, hey, you know, um, I can, we can afford child care now. So I'm actually going to go out and, and also participate in the work in the workforce, you know, so we may see, um, some uh, single earner families become dual earner families because now the um, the uh, equal, the math makes sense for them to be able to, you know, have have their other half, their their husband or or their wife or their other half, um, you know, go to work and and have the little one um, uh, in childcare. Uh, that's not th those kind of opening up those kind of options are really transformative for households. It can really help them to begin powering up their earnings to become homeowners um, to be able to you know further invest in their education or their career development and move themselves up as well. So um, long altogether, I think that the universal pre-K thing can absolutely have that kind of a conversation. I want to talk to DOE about it. I don't want to speak in advance of them. Um, but I do believe, too, that the um, child care um, component that's in the bill is actually going to have a very positive impact on the client base of our private daycare providers. So I wouldn't be too worried if I were them that there may be some kind of culling of the uh, 
of the um, market. I, I don't see that. I don't see that ultimately being the outcome. You also mentioned uh, at least one private university when discussing the provision about uh, having in-state tuition for out-of-state students. I just wanted to clarify that that program is not just for state-run schools, that uh, students could also avail of this subsidy for private colleges and universities. Sorry, I'm mute. I, I, that's a very good question. My, my assumption was that that was just for any kind of out-of-state tuition, but let me just make sure that what you're asking, I get you a, a firm answer on. So my team, if we can clarify, is the grant assistance only for state-run schools? I don't think so, but I want to make sure, I, I want to give you a, an answer that's 100%, Phil. So let me, let me double back on that. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Just uh, two more questions kind of in this vein of clarifying. Uh, you also mentioned the federal uh, matching rate for Medicaid. I believe that's the FMAP uh, and a schedule for uh, bringing that uh, closer to state parity uh, for parity for the rates that the states receive. I, I wanted to again clarify that uh, the Build Back Better bill uh, establishes a permanent fix for the Medicaid cliff and doesn't uh, do what other legislation have has done in the past, which is just uh, set a time frame and uh, basically a new deadline for us to revisit the issue. Well, I think to clarify, a lot of people don't realize that Medicaid as a program gets revisited uh, on a cycle. Um, I believe it's a ten year cycle um, uh, in the Congress anyway. And so the fact that our Guam Medicaid could be revisited in the future isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, I know that our Medicaid provisions here, I believe, is for an eight-year window, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I think that puts us right on the same cycle as the overall Medicaid review process. And so, um, yeah, uh, so, so this, this, this Medicaid solution will be a more longer term. There is a window for everything to kind of get taken away or needs to be renewed. Um, but but when, once we get into that kind of a groove congressionally, um, these things have a tendency to become... Um, Pro forma, and so that's ultimately what we're what we're hoping is the outcome here, because we've kind of gotten it for such an extended period, and um, and uh, the budgeting for that is not going. There, there's no one looking to spend the Guam Medicaid money on year nine, so because the funding for that is committed, and um, it's going to continue to be committed for that eight year period, and no one's looking at scalping it for some other purpose at a later date. Having that um, recycled when that when when that um, time frame comes up becomes very, very, I don't want to say easy, but it just becomes pretty, pretty standard. So um, it's not a permanent, permanent fix as in, you know, we fix it and we walk away, but it's, th that's not the case for Medicaid in general. Um, Medicaid constantly comes up for reviews. There's no, there's no such thing as permanent Medicaid. Um, but when ours comes up for review, we'll have an opportunity to renew it or to extend it for the same period or to extend it permanently. But again, I don't see that happening because everything has a review cycle. Um, but yeah, I, I would I would be very confident in saying that we can look forward to this being a permanent fix. Um, again, we got to keep our ear to the ground and just kind of make sure that you know there's no there's no weird conversations cropping up where someone's saying, "Oh, I want to take that away." Uh, we don't see that happening. This this was actually very bipartisan in getting us to this point of um, of, of of this kind of Medicaid coverage. So we're in a very healthy place, and I would I would I would be comfortable. Um, saying that this is something that we can look forward to for the foreseeable future. We just need to keep our eye on it and make sure that when it's time comes up for renewal, that that's something that just kind of takes shape uh, on its own. And and when it does come up in renewal, you said that it's going to be around 80 something percent, the, the federal the federal share for the FMAP would be around 80 percent? 83 percent, 83 percent, 17 percent for Guam. Um, you didn't mention it in the conference, uh, Congressman, but it, it was uh, brought up in uh, one of the breakdowns of the, the Build Back Better Act, and, and that's uh, the creation of a civilian climate core to help uh, fight the effects of climate change. On Guam, we're locally funding the uh, Guam Green Growth uh, Core, uh, Conservation Core, and so I'm wondering if uh, the funds identified in this provision would help free up some of the, I believe it's a recycling revolving fund uh, that we're using to pay for that core currently. I would, I would not encourage 
reprogramming local funding outside of the good, the good work that we're doing locally uh, because, because we have uh, federal funding available. I would encourage us kind of compounding that investment so that we can you know, further enhance the, uh, the outcomes of the, uh, of the effort. The Guam Green Growth folks have been doing some really neat stuff. Um, I, I really admire the work they've been putting in. We actually um, sat in for um, uh, a C grant um, call that they had to try and you know, um, graduate their program into a different tier. So I, I like the work that they're doing. I think that the local funding committed to that purpose is, is uh, well-placed. Um, if we are going to look at recommitting local funding, then let's make sure that we're, you know, evaluating those kind of uh, uh, restructurings in a way that's, you know, getting us outcomes for our people and not taking away from a good program to just, you know, create some kind of political slush someplace else that's less effective or less, has a less positive purpose for our people. But as far as the, um, the Civilian Conservation Corps funding, um, of course, those are going to be administered by Department of Interior. Um, we would encourage the uh, local government to work closely with them to see how we can, of course, maximize the uh, availability of those funds. Our islands and particularly our region, um, we're kind of on the front lines of the climate change issue. And so uh, the leadership that we provide in being able to create uh, uh, exemplary programs on the federal level um, for us to be able to, you know, kind of send the right message nationally that these are things that need to be looked at and this is how we recommend looking at them. Uh, th those are those are all balls that are going to be in our court, and we're going to be able to really, uh, really control the narrative on that. So, yeah, I would, I, I would, I would, I would not advise reprogramming local funds away from things that are, are really good for our community and, and people who are managing money well at the local level. Um, I would recommend that these be um, these be layered up on top of that, so that we can try and, and extract even greater value from really good programs out there. And my last question is about the advanced child tax credit extension. I just wanted, again, to confirm that this is a simple extension, so uh, parents can continue to either choose to enroll in the amortized advance payments or get the uh, full sum of the credit in the following year as scheduled. Yeah, you, you, you'll be able to get it as an advance payment, or if you don't want to get it as an advance payment, if Revan Tax provides you the option to defer that and just claim that at the end of your tax year, you can do that too. I don't see why that would uh, necessarily change. And, and no uh, increase in eligibility or increase in payments. It's just, uh, I think Troy mentioned it earlier, just a change from the end date a year out. That's correct, yeah. Not, none, of the, um, none of the qualifications have changed. It's simply just an extension. Okay, thank you, Congressman. And Phil, just to clarify, because I did get word back on the um, tuition assistance, the, the um, information I'm seeing here is that it's for public colleges na nationwide. So um, thank you for making sure I, I stayed accurate in what I was in my examples, but it looks like it's public colleges nationwide. And that means that it, it, we could benefit too, getting out of state uh, students coming to you enrolling in UOG for oh, their yes, state. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And you know, we have, we have one of the most attractive um, marine biology programs in the country. So yeah, we could absolutely benefit from students wanting to come out here and take advantage of the unique learning experiences Guam has to offer. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you to your team for the quick work. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Sir, we are now entering the second round of our questions and we have Jerry up for the second round. Jerry, you are recognized. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Congressman, uh, back to politics. <laughs> what do you think of the report that Senator Moylan plans to run for Congressman? If you run for governor, Senator Jim Moylan, I, I, I've been very impressed with Senator Jim Moylan over the course of his career. He's really um, taking um, positions that have been very, uh, very pro people, uh, very pro economic development, and uh, you know, nonpartisan. I mean, he doesn't get up there and try and, and, and you know, whip uh, whip for one party uh, at the expense of another. He really just kind of looks out for what's good for the people of Guam. So uh, if, if Jim's interested in the office, I, I think that that's a really good thing. On that note, what do you think of Senator Moylan as your vice gubernatorial running mate? <laughs> oh, you, you'll have to ask him. Uh, I think I, I, I kind of predicated uh, ad, ad nauseum earlier um, about what we would look for in a, in a lieutenant governor. Uh, and I think that my, my recent statements, um, specifically on Senator Moyden are kind of, of course, uh, aligned with that. But if, if that's something he wants to do, you would, 
I think that he would be the appropriate person to ask. <laughs> okay. If you do decide to run for governor, will you do so under the Democratic Party banner? Because, you know, you had your differences with the party, right? Or as an independent uh, third party candidate? You know, uh, Jerry, we kind of sit back and, and, you know, we're kind of amused. Uh, we see how um, the sitting administration purposely doesn't even acknowledge the existence of our office and anything federal that's being done. Uh, we see how party press releases are being put out that, you know, would get quotes from everybody else and kind of make it seem like we do not exist. Um, we see other senators who um, are constantly trying to um, tag along and piggyback on all the federal progress by introducing resolutions or writing letters to kind of, you know, create their association, uh, but also doing so while completely uh, um, ignoring uh, our office or making it seem like we don't exist. Uh, and, you know, those are Democrats, but we're not going to allow the behavior of others to negatively impact the work that we do for the people of Guam, nor are we going to allow that to be any kind of um, uh, impetus for any of the leadership or electoral decisions that we make. I'm a Democrat because my grandfather was a Democrat. And uh, I, 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 and I mentioned this in other platforms, I carry his full name in my name. And um, growing up, I watched the hard work that he did for the people of Guam. And uh, I saw where his heart was. And, uh, and, and I always wanted to be like that. You know, I always wanted to be, I always wanted to be like him. And so um, I'm a Democrat uh, uh, out, of, uh, out of that sense of, of, um, of nostalgia. Um, I don't believe that um, the current behaviors of some members of the Democratic Party are actually in line with the values of the Democratic Party. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to worry about that. You know, we're going to we're going to do what we do for the people of Guam. And I'm going to be a Democrat because I love my grandpa, you know, and, and ultimately when things come from good places, when things come from good places in your heart, then good things are going to happen. So, yeah, I, I, I'll likely run as a Democrat and, uh, and, and, and you all know why. Um, and, and we'll see where we go from there, because Guam, Guam is a uh, Guam is not going to succeed or fail based on any part particular political party. It's going to succeed or fail based on what's in the hearts of those who are who are leading us, and whether or not you know our intentions are to make things better for our island, and that's what it is. Back to. Okay, thank you, Congressman. Thank you. thank you, Jerry. Now recognizing Troy for his second round of questions. Troy, you're recognized. Thank you. Hi, Congressman. Uh, are you getting or have you gotten any help? On are you getting any help on a the passage of the Build Back Better, aside from, you already mentioned Juan Carlos Benitez. Anyone else helping? Our, our governor's office, the legislature, anyone pushing, helping this effort? I know that a resolution was introduced and they're trying to get it passed in the legislature um, sometime, I think this week or next week. Uh, I, I know the governor says that she's doing stuff, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to presume that people are doing something. I'm not going to presume that they're not, but I can't, I can't tell you what they are because I'm not informed of that. Um, but I can say that regardless of whether that happens or not, we're going to make sure that we get things done. That's our responsibility ultimately for us stops here. But so the governor's office is not, their Washington representative, or no one's reaching out to say, you know, we have these contacts here. How can we assist? Or where are you at with this so that we can help over here? Nothing like that's happening. No, that's never happened. Uh, are you concerned with so this, all of this money that's been flowing into Guam? Uh, are you concerned about the contracting of that money, corruption with the, with the use of that money, the contracting of that money? Uh, and then from there, uh, is there any money or will you be seeking any uh, funding support resources for, our, uh, for an inspector general? Uh, for our local FBI office, the U.S. Attorney's office, even the District Court of Guam, uh, this is a lot of money. So it's just sorry. Go ahead. No, I very much agree with you. And and, and to your to your initial concerns, I mean that was why when the legislature was rushing to borrow for the hospital, I was kind of like, what are you doing? You know, we already brought the Army Corps of Engineers on. They already told us that they're going to need about a year, a year and a half to do a really solid charrette 
to be able to figure out exactly what kind of hospital complex we want to build. We already discussed in the course of that conversation that there are Department of Interior grants that can go to funding the Army Corps of Engineers works so that we can get a really good study done and know what it's going to cost, what we're buying, how much it's going to be. And despite that, despite that, the legislature still ramrodded a bill through to authorize borrowing for the for a new medical facility. We have no idea what we're buying. We have no idea how much it's going to cost. We have no idea what kind of capacity it's going to have or, or how well it's going to address our needs going into long distance future. The governor even set aside 300 million that she's now saying she only needs 200 some million for. We now have um, additional federal money coming in that may be potentially used for this project. There's so many moving parts to, um, to getting this hospital um, situated. The last thing we should be doing is going out and taking out the loan for it because we have no idea what it is that we're buying. We have no idea you know, what it's going to cost and whether or not we're going to have um, actual dollars to offset it. And yet, the legislature still rammed through the borrowing bill. And why? Because once you put things into an indenture, you can't back out from it. They know that. And the ones who are pushing for this borrowing for this hospital that we still have no idea what it's going to be or how much it's going to cost, the ones who are pushing for the borrowing to happen want to lock things into the indenture so that once the indenture locks things up, then everything has to happen for, for those who are wanting it to happen a certain way. That's politics, and that's, you know, that's what we call corruption, but it's not necessarily illegal, I guess. It's just really stupid policy making. And that's ultimately what is driving, I think, this hospital agenda. Um, and so, yes, I am very concerned about how federal dollars are being permitted. I think that this ramming of the hospital borrowing authorization is a clear warning shot across the bow that every other federal resource that we're bringing in is likely going to be um, uh, kind of pigeonholed into these kind of agenda driven behind the scenes backroom deal making kind of things. And that's part of what's really fueling our governor conversation. You know, because in the end, I mean, there may be a rush to commit funding into contracts if there is a, a change in administration because people are going to want to lock in the deals that they've been working so hard to secure. Um, or, you know, there, there, there may not be. But if there isn't a change in administration and if there is a continuity in this kind of behavior and if it really does look as bad as it's looking, at least from my perspective, then I don't know it. Whatever we don't expend between now and nine months from now or nine and 12 months from now, I don't know what how, how much worse those kind of behaviors are going to be, you know, between now and five years from now, when we're talking about the remainder of all the federal money. So no, those are very, those are very legitimate concerns. Those are things that weigh heavily on my mind and, and really factor into a lot of big decisions that we have to make in the not too distant future. What about um, uh, any whether it's in the BBB or the infrastructure bill and in any of the administrative provisions, or maybe in future uh, uh, funding um, measures from your office or committee, uh, increasing resources uh, for an inspector general to take a look at funding uh, for our local FBI office here and also for the US Attorney's Office and the District Court. I think that those are very, very good opportunities that we should we should look into. Um, I really think that uh, a local inspector general also is something that probably needs to be impaneled. Uh, I would like to see one. If if you know, in if I was if I was chief executive, I would absolutely have an IG directly under me, going agency to agency, looking at how often you know how how long the lines are, how long the phones aren't getting answered, or how vacant the. Uh, how vacant the uh, workstations are, you know, and, and just giving us a real boots on the ground point of view on how things are operating. Um, but but absolutely getting our, our federal agencies more resources to be able to beef up their operations would be a good thing. Um, I am in very close communication with them. Um, they haven't necessarily indicated to me that they are struggling under, um, under a lack of resources, at least in some areas. We have identified other areas where there needs to be better collaboration and maybe some additional um, support being provided to tackle um, <clears throat> some, some, um, some drug vulnerabilities that we've, we've talked about recently. Um, but uh, yeah, if we, can, if we can get more resources in for um, helping to kind of tighten up that uh, environment, I think that's always gonna be a good thing. Yeah, I have a last question. I'm gonna jump onto the election year politics train. Uh, in terms and going back to that whole uh, lieutenant governor search, or I'm sorry, look at a, a possible lieutenant governor. 
candidate. Uh, I, I think you said someone who aligns more with uh, with you. And I think we can probably all of us who are on this call agree that you're more of a political maverick, if not a, a unicorn. How likely is it that uh, whoever you choose is actually <laughs> there? You go. <laughs> is actually not going to be um, a politician, so to speak. I mean, you've, 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 got a, you've got a pool of politicians, which normally are, that's where, that's where normally uh, a governor candidate chooses from. But I mean, throughout the years, there's always been talk about candidates choosing a, a doctor or a teacher or a lawyer or a businessman or something like that. Like, yeah, I, I, you know, we'll see. Um, we'll see. I, I think that if we, if we, if we make some kind of, uh, if we if we seek out any kind of partner that just looks like some kind of political marriage, I think that I would actually disappoint a lot of people. Um, I, I, my 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 take on it, and I'm sure that people can can chime in and let us know otherwise. But my take on it is, you know, they 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 if if they're going to want someone like me who's kind of you know not your normal political ice cream flavor, <laughs> they're they're gonna want a, they're gonna want a, um, they're going to want a uh, uh, an ice cream sundae that has a complementary flavor, not something that's going to, not nothing that's going to be completely um, off balance to what to what they're what they're wanting to to order, what they're wanting to have, and so um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely uh, be very careful about not um, not not losing sight of, of of where we've been or of who we are or of why the people actually support us because you know in the end, winning elections is. It's always a nice thing, but if you're if you're if you're not setting up the right the right kind of program um, to build to build the, uh, the to build the outcomes for the people that they're expecting, then it's just going to be a lot of disappointment for everybody, and that's not what we want to do. Well, thanks. Now you made me want to go eat a banana, Susanna. Where did you get banana, Susanna, Eric? <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Congressman. Thanks, thanks Troy. <laughs> Thank you, Troy. Sir, we do have one last follow-up question from Jerry. Jerry, you are recognized. Thank you. Uh, one last question, Congressman. Uh, sir, you were, uh, you were a finance guy before becoming a public official. Uh, what do you think of the, of the governor's uh, roadshow trip uh, presentation to the credit rating agencies? Uh, do you share Adeloop's uh, optimism that uh, we can get uh, investment uh, grade rating. I, I really do. I, I really hope that's the case. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily as a result of, of the governor's visit, um, though that's never a negative thing. But but the bottom line is, our credit rating, especially if it's going to be investment grade, our credit rating is going to have a lot more to do with the um, financial realities on the ground than anything else. And the financial rea realities on the ground are that we have brought in so much federal resources um, that we've kind of created um, a, 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 a stand-in economy that, that's filled the gap from our tourism that's um, helped to really keep us not only afloat, but to actually show in our Gov Guam revenues uh, significant surpluses. Um, what we do with those surpluses ultimately is going to be up to um, up to the body. Um, hopefully the legislature can have a say in it, but ultimately to the governor can figure out just where they want to spend that. But those surpluses are indicative of the fact that we have a very healthy, when I say healthy, I don't mean that the, that the operations are necessarily healthy. We just have a very healthy um, uh, receivable to payable ratio, meaning what we have coming in and what we have to expend, we actually have more coming in than we need to pay for. Uh, and again, that has a lot to do with, with, with so much federal resources that we brought in. So the rating agencies are going to look at that and they're going to say, hey, well, you know, they have a, a solid revenue base. It's continued. It's actually generated some very healthy surpluses. And they're going to see how that translates into potentially uh, an improved bond rating. Uh, so I think that it's, it's quite possible that we're going to see that happen. Uh, whether or not we're going to be able to sustain that higher bond rating is going to be something else entirely. Um, and ultimately, what we're going to be doing with those surpluses, I think, is going to really go um, go a long way towards whether we're heading towards um, improving the quality of life of our people by reducing 
tax burden than by bringing down the cost of goods because we're lowering the BPT, you know, and by investing in things like affordable housing and by helping um, helping our people to be able to, you know, find the resources to, to pay for to pay for the things that they need to pay for. Um, or are we going to take those surpluses and are we going to, you know, go out and do a lot of political hiring because it's an election year? You know, those are the kind of things that ultimately are going to decide whether we're going to be able to maintain this uh, this bond rating. But I think that in the short term, we likely will see um, an improvement in the ratings. Uh, if it's into investment grade, that'll be wonderful news. And uh, I'm looking forward to um, being able to celebrate that day that our finances uh, with the federal money that we've been able to bring in uh, have helped to help to get our, our bond ratings to a more elevated level. OK, thank you, Congressman. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, media partners, for all your questions. And thank you, Congressman Nicholas. We're going to go ahead and just open it a little longer for any last minute questions. As that does conclude our question order. There being none, Congressman Nicholas, that concludes the question and answer portion with our media partners. Thank you so much, T, and thank you again to our media partners and to your listening audiences for tuning in. Um, again, Build Back Better has passed today. Uh, we're confident that we're going to be able to continue to see a positive trajectory, and we're hoping that the first half of December at the latest will be when we finally get this enacted into law. Um, and the reason we we're expecting that timeline is, as we mentioned, the child tax credit and some of the other tax provisions that will be kicking in in 2022 would not would be it would be very important that they pass in 2021. Um, we have outlined uh, what we're looking forward to when that passes into law. We've also outlined what has already passed into law. And we're looking forward to all of these resources. Um, I think adding it all up, we're going to be looking at close to um, one and a half to one point seven five billion dollars in um, in total um, total infrastructure and family and disability and housing and broadband and water and um, child care and child tax credit um, benefits all making its way out to our island and to our people. And these are directly going to improve the quality of life of our people on Guam. And uh, while there may be differences of opinion on whether or not Build Back Better as an overall policy is good for the country, I am very grateful that as it moves forward, Guam is being included, Guam provisions and Guam needs are being met. I would very much like to thank my, my colleagues in the Congress. I'd like to thank my, my family and my staff for all of their hard work and sacrifices. And again, I'd like to thank our media partners for keeping us um, connected to your audiences and also for asking us the questions that you do to make sure that we're accurately reflecting what's in here. I, I've always, I'm always very big on accuracy and you guys help us to stay accurate. So thank you very much. Uh, with that, I uh, look forward to seeing you guys back on Guam in the not too distant future. Everybody have a wonderful, wonderful and safe Thanksgiving. God bless. Thank you, Congressman. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.